Praise God. Thank you, Ralph. Excellent job. Thank you so much. Praise God. Um, just not to make this about you, because I know you wouldn't want it to be about you, but doesn't Ralph have just such a sweet spirit about himself? I mean, he's just, uh, he's just such a gift to the body of Christ and to this church, and I appreciate you very, very much. And Ralph heads up and leads our Get Rooted classes, which we talked about. Um, that, those classes are sort of an introduction to our church and who we are and what we believe and stand for. And uh, I just feel like you know, no better than you to help represent who we are as a church and a ministry here, praise God. Um, when you got up your first service and received communion, I told Jeff between services, I said, before you even said a word, you began to minister to me just by how you, you came up here and just your humility and uh, just a blessing. Thank you again. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Um, glory, yes. <laughs> The Lord uh, began to deal with me this morning um, about some things going on that the Lord um, that's going on in our nation, that's going on in the world. Um, I'm not standing up here to tell you that I have, um, you know, any secrets to reveal to you um, uh, about what's going on specifically, but there are things that are happening. Um, in the world today that are not of God. <clears throat> and I was, I was, I was studying and, and preparing my message for this morning, um, as I do, and um, in the middle of it, I just kind of had to stop, and uh, the Lord was just ministering to me on this. And I thought, well, maybe this was just for me, you know, meaning that I was supposed to stop and pray. Um, and, and I did, and as I got up from my desk and walked around the room and was praying, um, for some of these things, the Lord began to deal with me that this was what I was supposed to uh, bring before the congregation today and, uh, and in both services. And so I'm just being obedient to that. And uh, in what he was speaking to my heart about was that there are things that are going on in the world that are not of God and that God is not pleased with them. And there are things that are happening or about to happen that can change the course of our times and our nation and other nations. And that these things can go one of two ways in the next few days. But if we, the church, would hear from the Lord and pray, things will begin to change today. So that was significant to me, and immediately what followed that was a scripture found in Zechariah where it says it's not by might, it's not by power, physical power, natural power, but he says, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. And I then went back to my desk and uh, opened up my Bible and, and began to read where that was found in Zechariah. And then I looked at it in the Amplified translation as well, the classic translation. And one thing that stood out to me was that ceasing it to yield, it said a, or causing it to yield, excuse me, a ceaseless supply of oil. And I thought that was significant where it said a, a, a ceaseless supply of oil because I've been teaching on the anointing in the last few weeks. And the anointing is symbolized with oil throughout the Scriptures. And we know from the Scriptures, we let the, the Word of God reveal what he's trying to say, and that's important for you to know, let the Word of God reveal what God's saying. Okay? That the Word of God, we looked in the book of Isaiah, and it were referred to the anointing, if you remember this, and it said that the anointing is the burden removing, yoke destroying power of God. 
And as I read this ceaseless supply of oil, I thought, well, certainly there is a ceaseless supply of the anointing, the burden removing, yoke destroying power of God. And when I read that and that came to my mind, I began to think about all that's happening in the world today, the evil, you hear it, you read about it, it's talked about. Yet the anointing of God, the burden-removing, yoke-destroying power of God, which is stronger and greater than any problems and any evil that the devil can stir up and conjure, this ceaseless supply of the anointing is powerful. And even though there are things that are happening in China, there are things that are happening in North Korea, there are things that are happening in Russia and in Ukraine, there are also things that are happening in other parts of the earth and of the world, even in our own nation, that are not being talked about, that are not being spoken of, that are not being reported, things that are happening in darkness and things that are happening in secret. And the devil is attempting to slip these things by the church. Because the church is very significant in the earth. I'm not talking about, when I say church, I'm not talking about, and I want you to think in terms of a religion or a building, I want you to think about in terms of the body of Christ. You and I are very significant for this time that we're in. The Bible talks about how the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Our prayers have significance, great significance. And the enemy has tried to, for lack of a better way of expressing this, dumb down the church and, and, and prayer amongst Christians to make Christians think the prayer is insignificant. But prayer is very significant in the earth today. It's very significant that you and I pray and that we pray prayers of faith and we release power and authority when we pray, right? You learn that at this church. You don't just pray and hope and, you know, well, you know, a lot of people look at prayer like gambling. It's not like that. When you pray, you believe, you receive. We look at that in Mark eleven twenty three, 23, right? How many times have we read that in this church? We see that prayers of faith get results. And that the enemy would love nothing more than to slip things past the church because the body of Christ, the church, is the one let me say it like this, entity that can do something about it. Amen. We can stand against evil. Like, no, like, you can't put all the big guns lined up. Nuclear power can't stop evil. But the church can. Yeah. I'm not... A, I, I, I'm, I'm not I absolutely am so grateful for our military and for our armed forces in this nation. Those who are serving, those who have served, there's nothing more that, that goes straight to my heart than our, than our military, men and women. And there is 100% a purpose for them in our nation and around the world. So I'm not belittling that in any way, shape, or form. But I am saying that prayer in the body of Christ has actually even more significance than that, than them. And things can be slipped by the church. And the only way that happens is if the church ignores what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. But nothing gets past God. Nothing gets past the Almighty. <laughs> he knows everything that's going on. Do you remember in the book of Kings when the prophet of God was instructing 
the armies of Israel, and he was giving them direction based on what the Spirit of the Lord was saying for them to do and where to go and how to go about warfare. So much so that their enemy and its leader was convinced that there was someone in their camp who was a snitch, who was a mole, who was, who was telling Israel their next move. And they went to that military leader and said, it's not anybody in our camp. It's the prophet of God in their camp. He's telling them what to do and he knows our move before we do it. And he goes so far to say, he even knows what goes on in the privacy of your own bedroom. Well, this guy only knew natural warfare. So what's he do? He's thinking, okay, go get the prophet then. That's the guy we need to take out. If we take him out then he'll stop telling them what we're doing. But the same God that was, that was protecting the armies of Israel was the same God that was obviously protecting that prophet. So they go and they surround that prophet of God and his helper, and here they are, and the helper goes out the morning and he begins to look around about and they're surrounded by the enemy. You remember the story? And they... He goes back in and says, you know, Master, what are we going to do? He says, fear not. He said, there be more with us than be with them. Amen. Now, what was that prophet of God seeing? What, was he, what, what, what in the world is he looking at? Well, he wasn't looking at what was obvious and in the natural. I'm going to say that again. He wasn't looking at what was obvious and in the natural. But what he was seeing and looking at was into the realm of the Spirit of God. And there is a spiritual realm of God that is in and around us today. And church, we have access to see what it is that God would have us to see by his Spirit for our life and for our nation. And then, you know, the prophet of God says to this young man, open his eyes that he might see. Now, he wasn't talking about his natural physical eyes because his natural physical eyes had no impairment. He was talking about the eyes of his understanding, his spiritual understanding. And when the Lord opened his eyes to see that, he saw chariots of fire surrounding the enemy. And that enemy did not take out that prophet Rather, they, <laughs> they, they walked them right into the camp. You can go read about it. And then you look at the Apostle Paul's writings in Ephesians. And he, I'm, I'm just going to read through some of this here. Praise God. It says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I'm reading Ephesians 1, 17, now going into 18. And it says, and it says the eyes of your understanding. Say that with me. The eyes of your understanding. This is, that's what is, is being referred to here, right? You have eyes of understanding. Say, I have, I have. Eyes, eyes of understanding. understanding. You know, one way you, I want you to think about this, or, or, or you consider thinking about it like this, I should say it like that, is that your spirit man, who you really are, you are spirit, you have a soul and you, have, and you live in a body, your spirit man has the ability to see has the ability to hear. It's how you hear from God. It's how you see these things from God. Amen? Amen? 
And you say, well, what do you mean see these things from God? Well, you know, don't get all caught up in it. Don't get all worked up in it and say, well, I've never seen anything from God. Well, you maybe have and didn't recognize it. Or maybe you just didn't open your eyes to see it. You know, you can close your eyes, natural physical eyes, and you can close your spiritual eyes. <laughs> I mean, you don't want to see something. You know, maybe you watch a movie and there's some part coming on that you go, ugh, 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 and you close your eyes, right? Well, people kind of, people kind of do this with their spiritual eyes. They don't want to deal with it, especially if, if the enemy has lied to them and, and told them that they can't do anything about it, that they're so insignificant. They just sort of close their eyes to it. They pay it no attention. He says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power, <clears throat> his power to usward. I'm going to read that again. His power to usward. There's a lot in that right there. Who believe? Say, I'm a believer. So you as a believer, the greatness of his power to us. He says, according, so now it's according to something. And it's according to the working of his mighty power. Oh, that's powerful in itself, isn't it? which he wrought, or which he worked, in Christ, when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head, who's Christ, right? To be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him. Glory to God. That filleth all in all. And you hath he quickened, or made alive, that's what the word quickened is, right? Who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in past times ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's the Antichrist spirit. It's anti-anointing. It's anti-burden-removing, yoke-destroying power. That's what's in the world today among whom also we all had our conversation in past times in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened or made alive us together with Christ. By grace you are saved and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Glory to God. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ, the anointing Jesus, the anointed one. For by grace are you saved through faith. Say that with me. For by grace are you saved through faith. He says, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ the anointed one, Jesus, unto good works, 
which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. Amen. Praise God. This awareness that we can have as Christians of things that are happening in darkness this awareness that we have needs to become yet even more aware and the only way that we are aware of these things is not by watching the news it's by hearing from the Spirit of God. Amen. Your source of information is not limited to that which is natural. Right. And if we will pay attention to the Spirit of the Lord, then these things will not go unnoticed by the body of Christ. And this is the will for God's people. In Chronicles, Second Chronicles, very familiar verse, in chapter 7, verse 14, says, If my people, who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, seek, I'm reading Amplified, he says, seek, crave, and require of necessity my face, and turn from their wicked ways, he says, then will I heal, uh, hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. <clears throat> I like what the Amplified pulled out there. It says, my people, well, that's us, who are called by my name, that's us, shall humble themselves. That's still us. <laughs> we have to humble ourselves. We have to humble ourselves. And this humility is imperative to have in place before we pray. And he says to seek, to crave, and to require of a necessity my face. He says, I'll forgive them, and I'll heal their land. Our land needs healing. Amen. Our nation needs healing. Amen. People of the world need healing. And you and I have everything to do with that healing process to take place. Amen. You don't just say, well, God heal them all. I hope, I, hope you, I hope you can get it done. No, there's some humility. There's some praying, some seeking that we do as the body of Christ. He's the head. He's the overseer of the church. He doesn't have to have the news tell the church what's going on. He can speak clearly and effectively to his body. And what I've noticed in my life over and over again, and I've seen this in the lives of other people as well, it's a very familiar, even a military tactic, is that the enemy will try to distract and get our attention on other things in order so that he can slip something by us on the other side. Or he'll get your attention on this thing and attack you from a different angle. But the Spirit of the Lord knows exactly where our eyes need to be looking and what we need to be seeing. And so this is important for us as a church that I remind you, a lot of you probably know this, but I remind you, let's not be distracted by what is obvious. I think back 
I've seen, you know, military movies. When I was a kid, my dad liked military movies. I liked military movies. And I remember one tactic was like in a jungle, you know, all this greenery all around, and all of a sudden there was something that was like white and hanging from a tree which was out of place. And then all of a sudden they fixate on them, and here comes the enemy. And I see that oftentimes how the enemy works today. He tries to get the church's attention on things that are insignificant in the big picture. And we spend so much time fixated on those things, all the while he's working, working, working the back door on the church. And so we're going to pray this morning. And I'm going to lead us in prayer, but I also want you guys to pray. It's not the prayer, all the prayer is not up to the pastor <laughs> or the leaders or the little prayer group or whatever else. It's all of us. Every, every one of us. <laughs> you know, there was a man by the name of Smith Wigglesworth who had significant results in his life in ministry. Kind of a rough and tough guy by description is of, of, of the readings I've read about him. <clears throat> and he was asked, because he had so many amazing miracles that took place as a result of his ministry, well, how much time do you spend in prayer? Right? And he says, well, I don't think I've ever prayed longer than 15 minutes in my life. And they were shocked and amazed. 15 minutes, that's it? You've never prayed longer than 15 minutes? And then he followed it up by said, you know, I don't know if there's 15 minutes that's ever gone by that I haven't prayed. <laughs> what was he doing? He was speaking to the point of a continual fellowship with the Lord. You don't, you don't have to cram all your praying in your you know, schedule and then sort of remiss the things of God and the Spirit of God for the rest of the day. It should be a constant fellowship and attuning in to the Lord. Have you ever, <laughs> I'm guilty of this, have you ever just had sort of like some a cruddy day, a little bit frustrated, a little bit irritated, and you ever notice like the hot button or the anger is just right below the surface, and, and you just hope that it doesn't get too bad, and boom, sometimes you sort of erupt, and then you try to get under control, and you erupt and get under control, and you just walk around on edge. Yeah, I have. But I've also learned that I don't have to live like that. Thank God. I don't have to have every little thing that anybody says or does rock my world and my boat. Now, I'm still working on this. It's a work in progress, okay? So I haven't accomplished. I'm not there, but I'm on the journey, okay? And I've learned that the same way a person can have that, that, that anger just like <clears throat> right there, you know what I mean? You can have the peace of God right there. The love of God right there. The presence of God just right there. And you can be functioning in your day, and next thing you know, you just begin to start singing praises to the Lord. You can be functioning in the day, and all of a sudden you begin to just pray unto the Lord. And you know what? Those days are so glorious. They're so wonderful. There's such peace. When I, when I bring myself to that place, I mean, I was, I was thinking about it in first service. I remember I was at I was just, you know, just, I had just been, took some time that morning and, and did my little devotional and I was driving, I had to go to Home Depot to get some things and, and I was just kind of singing and then praying and then talking to God and then, you know, just kind of just beep, beep, out of that, you know, and I got to Home Depot and I was trying to find what I was looking for. I couldn't find what I was looking for. You ever had that happen? And you can go one of two ways, right? You can get really frustrated 
This is one of my favorite lines. You can ask a professional in every department, which is not true. <laughs> but I remember I just began to just pray. I said, Lord, thank you for showing me and revealing to me exactly where this is at. And I remember finding what I needed, and it wasn't even in the right place. And it wasn't even where the associate said it was. And I'm like, God, it's just so amazing how much we limit you in our life. And yet you knew where this little item was the whole entire time. I remember another time I was at my computer and I was doing computer work, which is not my favorite thing to do. And I, and, uh, I, I was having challenges with it, and with what I was trying to get accomplished. And I remember I just began to pray and pray in the Spirit. I began, began to sing and things like that. And you know what? There, when that happens, uh, in the presence of the Lord, there is no strife. There is no stress. There is no worry. There is no care. And you can invite the presence of God in everything you do, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I believe this is how the body of Christ is actually designed and created to operate. And you may be thinking, that is the most foreign idea to my mind, what you're talking about, that I've ever heard. Well, there was a time in my life where it was kind of foreign to me, too, you know. But I had a really good example, which was my mom, who did this on a regular basis. Now, she wasn't perfect at it, but so many times I, I learned how to really just welcome, and she would teach us as kids the presence of God. And we were little guys, you know, and she would teach us, hey, you know, invite the presence, you know, realize that the presence of God is with you all the time. Amen. And you could just enter into his presence anytime you want. Yep. You think about that? A lot of Christians, some Christians, the only time they are even somewhat remotely aware of the presence of God is in a meeting like this, like a church meeting. Well, you're missing out, and you don't need to miss out. We need to be aware. Because when our eyes are closed, the enemy can slip things past us. But when our eyes are open, we can see some things. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to pray, and I'm encouraging you and asking you to pray with me. I'll lead us in prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we honor you. You alone are worthy to be praised. And Lord, we thank you that you have given to us a standard, a standard of righteousness and a standard of truth, that you are faithful, that you are just. And Lord, you are just to forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord, that you have instituted communion and as we participated this morning and received of the elements, Lord, I thank you, Lord, we are yet again reminded of your grace, of your mercy, of your love, and of your power. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you. And we ask you to bless and to heal our land. We pray for our nation. We pray for its leadership. We pray for its citizens. And we pray for all of its inhabitants. And that they would know you as Lord. That they would serve you as Lord. They would know you as their Savior, their healer, their deliverer, their provider. And Lord, we pray that we as a nation would have no other gods before us. That we would never bow down ourselves to any other image or any other idol 
and serve no other than you. We would not serve money, fame. We would have nothing above you. And we pray that we hide our word, excuse me, your word in our hearts, that we might not sin against you. And that we would walk by faith and not by sight. And that we would love you with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our strength. And that we would love our neighbor as ourself. Say that with me. And that we would love our neighbor as ourself. Say it again. And we would love our neighbor as ourself. Lord, we recognize that's not just the person who lives in the physical home or apartment or condominium next to us, but this is loving mankind, loving those who are closest to us and around us each and every day. The people driving on our roads, the people that we shop with and hang out with, and all those that are around us. And Lord, that we would diligently obey your voice and cleave to you. You are our length of days and our life. And Father, apart from you, we can do nothing. So we choose that in grafting in the vine, connected to the vine. And Father God, I pray for the saints in the body of Christ that warriors would rise up and come forth by the Spirit of the Lord to fiercely tread down powers of darkness and wickedness and that captives would be set free. Burdens would be removed, yokes would be destroyed, and the power of God and the anointing would be in full demonstration. And I pray that godly people would begin to rise up and take their positions of authority over the forces of the enemy and over all those who have blinded the minds of nations and those who are followers of darkness and destruction. And that unsaved people would be drawn into your kingdom and into your glory by the Spirit of the Lord, by the love of God, by the grace of God, by the wisdom of God, and by your provision. That your goodness would lead men to repentance. And that your Spirit would be poured out onto all flesh, and people's blinded minds would be renewed to the truth. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And that your people would overcome evil with good. And I pray that your children will walk in the strength of God. And as we enter into the arenas of influence that you have ordained for us to go into, that we would see victory at every battle. That we would overcome every obstacle and that we would never be afraid in any situation. And we walk by faith and not by sight. Praise God. Thank you that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love, 
and a sound mind. So, Lord, we pray that your church would go to another level of spiritual awareness, and that we would recognize the lies of the enemy, we would recognize strategic maneuvers of the enemy, we would pray accordingly by faith, and those plans and plots and schemes and wiles would be stopped. They would be exposed and brought into the light. And where the enemy has laid up traps of destruction for our lives, we would see them and avoid them. We'd trigger the trap and not step in it. And they'd be caught in their own devices. And that somehow, some way, by your spirit, our military leaders would receive direction that comes by the supernatural wisdom of God. And they would give command, not according to that which is of the natural understanding but that which is ordained and directed of you. And that lives would be saved as a result of it. And unnecessary bloodshed would be avoided. Yet the necessary bloodshed shed would take place, and evil would be stopped as a result of the strategic hand of God. And Lord, that we would continue to look to you, the author, and the developer, and the perfecter, and the finisher of our faith. And we give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. And we refuse to be distracted and deceived. In Jesus' name, amen. Give him praise and glory for that. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I'm just going to teach you for just a few minutes here, because that was what the Lord had for me to do this morning. Appreciate your willingness. The Lord really spoke to me about our church, said you've got to be willing to be nimble. You know what that means? You know, you've got to be agile. And as a pastor and as a leader, you've got to be willing and agile. Don't just get stuck in a routine, in a way, and that goes for us as a body of Christ, right? Because we have to be willing to what the Spirit of the Lord says. Go, we go. Do this, do this. Do that, do that. Right? And I said, well, that's not how we usually do it. Don't get used to how it's usually done. As soon as you get used to how it's usually done, the Spirit of the Lord usually changes it. Why? So you don't fall in love with the usual. Amen. Praise God, yeah. Huh. Praise God, and I, I've, I've, I've found this to be true in life. Praise God. All right, you have your Bible? All right, well, at least six of you do. That's good. <laughs> Go to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. Now remember that your Bible is important. Your Bible is valuable. Your Bible has significance to you, to your life. It's not just, a, it's not just like a, a history book that you kept from college. The Bible is God's living word. It's filled with life and wisdom for every day, for all time, forever and ever and ever. We are told that heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will remain. So if nothing else, hold to and cherish the word of God. Amen? Don't look at it. It's not some religious book. It's God's word for you and I. 
and it will stand the test of time. It has and it always will be. And God, through his word, reveals his will for your life. There's nothing more frustrating than not knowing the will of God for your life. But there's nothing more satisfying than knowing it and following it. If you're frustrated about your life and where you're at, then just get into what God's will is for your life. And you can do that at any age, at any point. Amen? Amen. And you can either choose to cooperate with his will, or you can choose to ignore his will. I'm going to read here just a little bit. That was worth coming to church for right there. (laughs) Now listen, he said, today I'm giving you a choice between life and death, between prosperity and disaster. He says, for I command you this day, I'm Deuteronomy 30, 15, apologize, I don't know if I told you, I'm reading New Living this morning, he says, I command you this day to love the Lord your God and keep his commandments, decrees, regulations by walking in his ways. He says, if you do this, you will live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are about to enter in and occupy. He says, but if your hearts turn away and you refuse to listen, If you draw away to serve and worship other gods, then I warn you now that you will certainly be destroyed. That's pretty heavy duty. What stood out to me was, he says, if you were drawn away to serve and worship other gods. If you are called to worship here, you're called to serve here. Well, I thought my tithe was my country club dues. I pay my dues, you serve me, right? Wrong. It's not how it works. This is the body of Christ. You need to read your Bible. But that's almost the mentality that some people have in churches. What do they want from me? I gave. Yeah, how much? Enough. Well, there's a woman who gave two mites, and Jesus said she gave more than the rest of them. Because she gave her all. I said she gave her all. You say you give your all in church, a lot of people are like, oh, what time are we getting out of here? (laughs) He goes, verse 19, today I will give you the choice between life and death, between blessing and curses, Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. And he says, oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You see, the Spirit of the Lord is going to minister to us Things that will change our life. Yet we must be willing to cooperate with the Spirit of the Lord. Because the Spirit of the Lord is there to teach us. The Spirit of the Lord is there. We looked at this a couple weeks ago, right? Oh, let me stop. Thank you for ministering last Sunday. I, I, I made a comment Thursday when you were here, but I wanted to do it Sunday morning in front of the congregation. Thank you, Minister Leslie, for ministering last week. It was outstanding. Thank you very much. Blessed our life. Appreciate it. He's here to teach us. The Spirit of the Lord is here to correct us. He's here to help us. He's here to lead us, right? He's here to guide us. All these things we know that the Spirit of the Lord is is to do us. But listen, he never teaches us without instructing us. And what I mean by that is he never says, well, this is what you're supposed to do, and you've got to figure out how to get it done. No, he gives personal instruction on his teaching. And he sticks with you until you get it. He's like the teacher and the tutor. Have you ever had a teacher that teaches you something and you don't get it? And then they take the time to personally give you instruction so that they know that you get it? 
isn't that, isn't that just a relief if you've ever been a student and, and had a difficult time in a particular subject when you're like, why? And you're thinking to yourself, why can't I get this? You're just like this, this brain block or whatever else it is. But the teacher is so gracious and kind and patient and continues to help you and help you and help you until you get it. Have you ever had a teacher that doesn't do that? It's a raunchy deal. You're like, they're like, that is what it is, figure it out. Oh man, I used to go home and read. read uh, uh. The point you just want to give up. That's not the teacher he is. That's not how the Holy Spirit teaches. When he teaches, he instructs. When the Holy Spirit corrects, he helps us. He helps you to make the proper correction. Not only does he convict and correct, but then he helps you in your life with that correction to get you on that path. When he helps us, he leads us. When he leads us, he guides us. He goes before us. He says, this is how you do it. He doesn't point and say, do that, and you better figure it out. He personally takes our hand and guides us through it. And he never does any of this apart from love. There will be love through every aspect of his help, of his teaching, of his instruction, of his guidance, of his everything of who he is. God is love. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. But his love is there to carry you to and through and into the truth, into the way, and into the life. He's not just like, you got to figure it out, you're by yourself. That's what this relationship that God has for every one of us. He's so big that he can have a relationship with every person on the planet. Yet far too few take advantage of that relationship. Especially to the degree, I don't know if any of us really take advantage of it to the degree that we actually can. Some more than others, though. This is the God we serve. He's not an idol. He's not just a... a, a, a inanimate object he's alive he's risen he is seated at the right hand of the father in fact where we were reading there in Ephesians remember he said that he hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ it's like even in his ascent, he never leaves us. He's still showing us a picture of this oneness with him. And this is the one thing that the disciples were kind of freaking out about because he was about to leave. Yet we see that in his leaving, he just brought us with him. You say, what are you talking about? We're here. In the realm of the spirit, you can be two places at once. Hmm. Praise God. You remember Noah? Of course. He was told to build an ark. Wasn't he? A couple things to notice real quick. God didn't drop an ark out of the sky... already pre-made with which some people would like that to happen. God calls you and tells you to do something. You're like, well then God, if you want it to happen, make it happen. That's not how it happened. He gave him the dimensions of how it was supposed to be built, didn't he? So not only did he give him the, the instruction or the, the direction, he gave him the instruction to go with it. And you got to know not only do I know now the dimensions, because they're in the Bible, he's got to give me the tools to get it done. 
which is almost a bigger thing than building it in itself. Everything he needed to build that ark, God provided. Everything you need to build your life in Christ, God has provided. And every instruction on how to do it and carry it out and hold it together, he has provided. There's actually nothing apart from him that he hasn't provided. He's got everything you need. You'll never get to a place and go, up. Oh, I'm at a dead end. I don't know where else to go. There's no more provision. God always provides. If we just keep looking to him, keep our eyes on him, he always provides. He always makes a way. And it's interesting because if you read down through that area in Genesis, talking about Noah, at the very end it says, so Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. That was the key to the success of that vessel, of that boat, of that ship. Noah obeyed God. And our obedience is still just as important today as it was that many thousands of years ago. And God is still instructing his church each day, every day, in ways after ways after ways of our life, how we should live our life, how we should do what we do, how we should go about what we have to go about and do. Did you get something out of this? Stand to your feet, please. Praise God. Again and again and again, the Bible reveals to God's people how to do what God's called them to do. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for your, your ministry of your, of your spirit in this place. Lord, thank you for these people that have a heart for you, that love you, that serve you, that came to this church today to receive of you. Lord, you never disappoint us. You always provide for us everything that we have need of. Lord, I thank you for your peace, for your patience, your kindness, your goodness. And that you model it perfectly for us. And we have an example, and you'll hold our, you'll literally take our hand and walk us through it. If we will simply believe that we can operate and live this way. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. I never want to assume just because you walked into these doors that you're saved and you're a Christian. So if you're here and you've never confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believed in your heart that he was raised from the dead, that he's the son of God, I want to give you that opportunity to, to pray with you today. So if that's you here, as I go to dismiss here in just a minute, Step out of your seat, walk down this aisle, and let us have the opportunity to pray with you. There'll be people up here. If you're on the list today, come up here now if you will. <clears throat> or if you'd like prayer in any other area of your life. If you'd like prayer, maybe you're going through something physically or whatever it may be, or you know someone that needs prayer, we're up here to join our faith with your faith and believe God for a miracle. Praise God. So we are here to pray with you. Remember that you're the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, blessed going in, blessed going out, and everything you set your hand to, you're the lender, not the borrower. You're good looking. You're dismissed. God bless you.